Hi everyone, today we'll be talking about neurology short cases in the PACES examination. So just a disclaimer, um, firstly I'm not a neurologist and this deck of slides is not intended to be uh, comprehensive uh, nor does it replace um, a systematic understanding of uh, neurolocalization. Um, but what it aims to do is to provide a very exam-centric uh, framework and um, to highlight certain things to just focus on and to just provide you a, a uh, overview of what's the very basics that you would require for neurology cases. So let's start. So um, I always like to begin with um, reminding everyone of what is commonly tested because uh, at the end of the day, this is an exam and knowing what comes out is um, half the battle won. So I've broken this down into cranial nerves, upper limbs and lower limbs. For cranial nerves, you could either get single nerve pathologies of which commonly three, six, seven would come out. You can have your clubs like your superior orbital fissure, cavernous sinus uh, lesions. Um, Non-conforming cranial nerve uh, pathologies, so this could be meningeal disease, uh, base of skull um, disease, uh, head and neck tumors with previous surgery. Um, you also have the entity of complex ophthalmoplegias, <coughs> bulbar pseudobulbar palsies, horners, and visual field defects. So this should cover a majority of cranial nerves. In terms of upper limbs wise, um, <coughs> you have uh, Parkinsonism and cerebellar disease as uh, two big entities. Um, you also have uh, myelopathies that uh, kind of overlap with um, some of the uh, lower motor neuron, upper motor neuron disease, depending on the level of the lesion. Um, in terms of the lower motor neuron uh, disease of the upper limbs, this is usually not too different from that, which affects the lower limbs as well, because they tend to be uh, diffuse uh, systemic um, disease manifestations. In terms of lower motor neuron monoparesis, then you have um, your uh, individual nerve palsies uh, of the upper limbs as well as reticulo and plexopathies. In terms of the lower limb wise, uh, you have uh, lower motor neuron uh, bilateral lower limb lesions, uh, which would be similar to the group uh, mentioned above here. Um, but also not to forget uh, corda equina as an important differential to exclude. Uh, as well as um, some of the congenital diseases such as uh, spina bifida. In terms of uh, upper motor neuron uh, lower limb uh, lesions, uh, this would be uh, similar to the myelopathies and uh, as well as some other unique conditions. And I also uh, put foot drop as a separate entity, although it tends to overlap as well, uh, because it is something that I would like to um, identify and pick up early in the course of my examination. So this is an overview of what comes up frequently. So we move on to inspection as uh, everyone who teaches PACES would always emphasize and remind us. Uh, inspection is very powerful and very important, and especially for neurology, many things can be picked up. So in the, in the cranial nerve uh, examination, ptosis is uh, something that is usually uh, quite apparent. Uh, and um, once you identify ptosis, your mind starts homing in on things like whether or not there's any disconjugate case, then you start thinking about conditions like myasthenia, uh, cranial nerve three palsy, um, possibly hornus. Uh, next would be a disconjugate case. Uh, facial nerve palsies also tend to be um, fairly uh, obvious uh, when the patient is on any nasogastric tube. Certain things may need to be hunted for, so such as scars, so it's important to pay attention in the entire head and neck region uh, because for any head and neck tumor, scars can appear in all areas and can be quite well hidden uh, by the hair. So it's also important to examine along the hairline and lift up the hair uh, or if let's say the patient has any headgear on to uh, politely request for that to be removed. Um, the voice of the patient will also give you a clue uh, in certain conditions such as bulbar and pseudobulbar palsies. In terms of the upper limbs, um, apart from um, general things that you look out for, like wasting, uh, it is important also to, um, to consider certain uh, things that you may want to incorporate into your screening. So for me, I incorporate uh, screening for grip myotonia as well as scapular winging uh, because these are conditions that um, if you can pick these signs up right at the outset, it gives you the diagnosis right away and um, 
at least you can spend the rest of the examination just uh, being assured that you've got the diagnosis and just eliciting other relevant signs. So ask patients to grip and release and also ask them to push against me uh, for scapular wing and examine the back carefully. Um, in terms of lower limbs wise, uh, I'll examine the paraphernalia for any gait aids, whether patients on any indwelling catheters, whether they're obvious scars, uh, deformities, etc. Um, I also like to ask my patients to just dorsiflex their ankles to see whether or not there's uh, any unilateral uh, foot drop. Because um, like earlier mentioned, if this is an approach to a unilateral foot drop, I'd like to know this early because some of the um, power testing uh, may be uh, contextually unique to an approach to a um, unilateral foot drop. So we move on to some of the cranial nerve conditions. Uh, I won't be belaboring each condition much because um, the, the idea of this stack of slides is to just provide an overview. But we'll talk about cranial nerve 3 first. So um, on inspection, you would see a down and out pupil. Um, there's usually uh, impaired uh, extraocular eye movements, ptosis, with or without pupillary dilatation, uh, depending on the etiology. It's important to also attempt to elicit for cranial nerve 4 involvement because this will tell you whether it's just a single nerve pathology or whether it can be one of the clubs. Uh, so to, to evaluate intorsion, you ask the patient to look in and uh, downwards with that affected eye. So it's so important to screen for other um, associated neurological deficits. So if there's associated hemiparesis, um, this can be seen in Weber syndrome, as well as if there's uh, associated cerebellar dysfunction, this would be uh, eponymously termed Benedict's. Um, Causes-wise, um, yeah, as uh, explained below, cranial 6 uh, is characterized by impact impaired uh, abduction of the affected site. It's important to offer to screen for papilloedema as this can be a false localizing sign of raised intracranial pressure. And causes uh, can be classified as medical uh, and surgical as listed below. So cranial 7, facial nerve palsy, is something that most of us are familiar with. Um, if one wants to go in greater detail, one can also elicit for um, other features of uh, hyperacusis, loss of taste, uh, due to the innovation by the Corda Tibbani to um, elicit where exactly the level of lesion is, but most of the times uh, this is not absolutely essential in the PACES exam. Um, it is important to be able to differentiate lower motor and upper motor neuron cranial 7 pathologies and to be able to evaluate for um, common uh, physically examinable sites such as the parotids, uh, the years for vesicles in Ramsey Hans, uh, as well as any mastoid parotid scars. Uh, and a pronator drift. Um, so these are uh, causes of uh, unilateral lower motor neuron cranial nerve 7 palsies uh, as listed here. The causes for bilateral uh, cranial nerve 7 lower motor neuron disease is also a question that likes to be asked in the basis context. So especially if you're taking the exam overseas, uh, conditions such as sarcoid needs to be uh, on your differential list. Treatment is as listed below. So then we talk about the clubs. Um, clubs wise, uh, it's a lot of uh, memory work and visualization uh, of how the nerves traverse. Um, but listed here are the common clubs as well as their common uh, etiological diagnosis. So you can just uh, have a look through the list of it. Um, I think more importantly is when you pick up an apparent cranial nerve deficit, it is important to, to be able to systematically screen around uh, those cranial nerves in order for you not to miss a club uh, and instead calling it a single cranial nerve deficit. So when we talk about cranial nerves, um, we cannot escape uh, this concept of the cranial nerve uh, rules of four which states that, number one, all cranial nerves originate from the brainstem except cranial nerve 1 and 2, which means that a brainstem pathology can cause cranial nerve deficits. Secondly, uh, the cranial nerves are all grouped together in certain locations called clubs that we have gone through. Uh, thirdly, all cranial nerves pass through the meninges and base of skull, so any form of leptomeningeal disease such as infection, neoplastic disorders and infiltrative disorders can cause skipped cranial nerve lesions and pathologies and any base of skull trauma, neoplasm can likewise do the same. And finally, it's important to remember that cranial nerves can also be affected by systemic disorders 
Um, and this sort of uh, ties in with our lower motor neuron, um, upper lower limb pathology. So muscle NMJ, peripheral nerves, and anterior horn cell disorders can also cause uh, cranial nerve um, deficits. So we next talk about this entity of uh, complex ophthalmoplegia. So simply speaking, a complex ophthalmoplegia is a ophthalmoplegia that cannot be fully explained away by a single cranial nerve pathology uh, of 3, 4, and 6. So you can think of it in terms of several ways, whether it's central peripheral, or whether it's predominantly vertical versus uh, horizontal, or whether it's um, you know, mixed with no uh, specific pattern. Um, for central causes, it's important to consider uh, multiple sclerosis and to attempt to elicit whether or not this ophthalmoplegia fits a certain specific pattern of um, either INO or one and a half. So you can spend time just revising of um, what this looks like and the underlying um, involved nuclei and uh, the explanation behind the phenomenon. Uh, neuromyelitis optica, uh, progressive uh, supranuclear palsy with associated uh, Parkinsonism features uh, will be considered central causes. Then we move on to the group of um, peripheral causes that we are quite familiar with. So for the nerve level, you have GBS, uh, middle fissure. If you get very skipped kind of uh, lesions, it's important to consider mononeuritis multiplex. At the NMJ, myasthenia, muscle, thyroid disease, um, and some other uh, conditions such as uh, melanoma with a glass eye, which is rare in the neurology, neuro neurology examination. And if it's predominantly up gaze, it's important to consider PSP first. Uh, Perinox is not something that is common in the PACES examination. Um, so we've gone through these differentials uh, in terms of their, um, their, their etiological basis. But I think more importantly in the PACES exam is to be able to contextualize this with associated clinical signs. So once you've established that this patient has a complex ophthalmoplegia, it's important to hunt for other neurological deficits, namely cerebellar, um, any upper or lower motor neuron signs, uh, any uh, element of fatigability, or any signs of Parkinsonism. Because uh, as listed below here, this would cue you into what the likely diagnosis is. So this is something important to just pause and bear in mind. Um, and with, when we talk about other, uh, other conditions or other phenomena such as um, Parkinsonism and cerebellar dysfunction, once again, we would um, hunt for other forms of neurological deficits and together when they are present, um, you can usually narrow down your differentials. So we talk about Baba pseudo Baba palsy. Baba is basically the lower motor neuron um, version of the lower cranial nerve palsies, and pseudo Baba it's uh, upper motor neuron uh, manifestation. So the causes and the features are listed as uh, here. Hornus is uh, something to be familiar with. Uh, it is important to be able to identify features, be able to classify your causes based on the level of the lesion, and once again also be able to conduct a physical examination that looks for associated features, be it neurological or non-neurological, as in the case of scars, lymph nodes, to be able to narrow down um, your differentials. Uh, listed below are also the investigations to confirm, localize, and to further characterize um, the cause of corners. Ptosis. So ptosis is something that we see uh, fairly frequently in PACES. Um, when we think of ptosis, uh, the conditions in the neurological examination that come to mind, uh, myasthenia, cranial 3, and corners, we can think of it in terms of um, whether it's bilateral, unilateral, um, whether there's involved uh, pupillary uh, dysfunction or whether there's any associated ophthalmoplegia. So the causes are listed below. In terms of visual field defects, it's important to be able to broadly categorize whether this is a monocular problem, where it's only one eye affected, or whether it's a hemianopia, where both eyes are affected, and whether it's a homonymous or bitemporal. So bitemporal usually suggests involvement at the optic chasm, um, if you're able to characterize whether it's more upper field or lower field, this would allow you to um, better uh, 
provide differentials that are more likely to, to explain one over the other. So if it's more lower field, the compression is usually from above, so this is usually a cranial pharyngioma, and it's from below, it's usually a pituitary or a supracellular meningioma. Um, thereafter, if, if let's say it is a homonymous hemianopia, um, the first thing that you should mention is that this is likely a retrochiasmal lesion before you move on to trying to elucidate where exactly it is. Because sometimes you are not able to do so because uh, sometimes um, parts of the temporal parietal occipital lobe are affected. And all you can say is that, you know, it's a homonymous hemianopia. Uh, and uh, whether or not there is uh, macular sparing is sometimes difficult to elicit uh, crudely on the um, neurological examination. Uh, this is a mnemonic to help you whether it's uh, superior or inferior. So TIPS, temporal for inferior and parietal for superior. So we talk about Parkinsonism. This is once again uh, something very common. It can happen in the neurological station or in the uh, station 5 uh, instance. So it's important to know what the cardinal features are um, to be able to hunt for Parkinson's plus uh, syndrome such as MSA, PSP, clinical basal degeneration. It's important to assess for function uh, and to remember the non-motor manifestations of Parkinson's. So this would um, be manifested in terms of mood, uh, sleep, uh, autonomic uh, function such as um, opening bowels, passing urine, smell, uh, as well as uh, mental health. Um, also uh, missing here would be secondary causes of Parkinsonism, so drugs, uh, trauma, um, space-occupying lesions, uh, some of these differentials. So next would be cerebellar uh, disease. So cerebellar disease uh, can be, I, I like to think of it in terms of whether it's unilateral or bilateral. And then um, I try to contextualize my differentials based on the age group of the patient and the demographic of the patient. So what I mean by this, so in the, cause, in the context of a unilateral cerebellar pathology, if it's, a, if it's an older patient, usually I would say stroke, um, space-occupying lesion. If it's a younger patient, then differential such as demyelinating disorders tend to come out um, as uh, earlier in my differential list. Um, once again, it is important to be able to elicit uh, associated neurological deficits such as um, if there's hemiparesis, we think about ataxic hemiparesis, if there's any eye movement or pupillary reaction uh, dysfunction, we can think of uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, and if there are any other neurological deficits, you can think of uh, CP angle or lateral medullary syndrome. Um, so as mentioned, for bilateral disease in younger patients, I think about congenital disorders, uh, demyelinating disorders in older patients, uh, things such as um, metabolic, like alcohol, uh, drugs or perineal plastic disorders would uh, rank more highly. So as mentioned uh, below, these are the extra features that you can hunt for with the associated uh, diagnosis that is tied with it. When we talk about myelopathies, um, it is important to consider two dimensions, that there is both a horizontal and a vertical axis. So the horizontal axis is basically uh, where within the, the cord, whether it's more anterior, more posterior, more central cord. And in terms of the vertical axis, we're thinking of which level it is. Um, so depending on where the lesion is, uh, the manifestations will, um, that predominates will differ. So in young patients, I think about congenital demyelinating disorders. In older patients, I think about more degenerative neoplastic disorders. So this, um, this skill of contextualizing differentials based on age is something I find quite helpful given that uh, in the short case, you don't have the luxury of taking a history to find out the tempo of onset. If it's more posterior column disease, um, subacute uh, degeneration of the cord should be considered in B12 deficiency, tabis dorsalis, and pedrix ataxia. If it's more anterior column, then anterior spinal infarction should be considered. And uh, these are the uh, mentioned clinical features uh, of a central cord syndrome where um, it's more upper limb compared to lower limb involvement with a suspended sensory level to pinprick but preserve proprioception uh, and there may be hornus and upper motor neuron signs. So we think trigomyelia or intramedullary tumors in this case.
So this, the group of symmetrical lower motor neuron weakness, um, basically it's whether it's a muscle, NMJ, peripheral nerve, or anterior horn cell uh, disease. This can be upper limb or lower limb or sometimes even cranial nerves. I think the key distinction features are whether it's um, the sensory involvement because if there, there is sensory involvement, then it can't be a muscle, NMJ, or anterior horn cell problem. Um, if there isn't sensory involvement, it could still be any because some of the peripheral nerve disorders can be predominantly motor as well. Um, and then we think whether it's more proximal or distal. Proximal typically would be muscle or NMJ and distal peripheral nerves. Uh, um, yeah, but once again, there are exceptions to these rules. So we talk about the individual uh, conditions. So for myopathies, FSHD and myotonic dystrophy are patients' favorites. So in FSHD, um, it would be good if you can pick up the scapular, the scapular winging um, even before you you actually conduct a full neurological examination. Um, there's proximal myopathy, there's often uh, facial weakness and peroneal weakness, uh, and there can be associated cardiomyopathy, hearing loss, and cognitive impairment. So uh, if you notice uh, any um, cardiac implantation devices, any hearing aids, this is worthwhile pointing out. In myotonic dystrophy, um, there are features such as the um, male frontal pot, uh, balding pattern, uh, that can be that can cue you in as to um, this being a differential, but grip myotonia is something that I like to elicit uh, even before I move on to my neurology my neurological examination, and um, in in the midst of it, when suspecting myotonic dystrophy, I would uh, elicit percussion myotonia and eye closure myotonia. Um, and once again, these are the associated features of myotonic dystrophy. So, um, for example, in a station 5 case, it can be a syncope due to cardiomyopathy. Uh, it could be due, it could be, uh, you could notice uh, finger prick marks or a glucometer at the bedside uh, that may suggest uh, diabetes mellitus. Um, or there could be visual or hearing problems with the attendant complications of cataracts and hearing loss. Myasthenia is something that is familiar to us with the cardinal features of vertical ptosis, complex ophthalmoplegia. It can be barbar involvement and uh, limb involvement. Um, it can be an approach to examine the patient's eyes, uh, cranial nerves, or upper limbs. Um, in attempting to, to elicit ptosis, there are several uh, reinforcement maneuvers um, of which um, different neurologists may have different preferences and different levels of comfort, but it's important to recognize that some of it can be quite distressing for patients, such as um, shining the torch uh, on the patient's pupils or elevating the eyelids. So it's important to basically come up with what is comfortable for you in terms of uh, the reinforcement maneuvers to accentuate ptosis. Um, so investigations-wise, it's important to offer a negative inspiratory force to uh, evaluate for respiratory stability. Uh, bedside tests such as ice pack, knowing your types of neurophysiological studies are important. And the other and the associated auto antibodies um, to to send for. So peripheral neuropathy wise, we can think of it in terms of um, etiology. So some think of it in terms of A to to J. I always like to put diabetes in front because it's the commonest cause. Uh, it can be motor predominant or sensory predominant, uh, and it is important to. Uh, to, to be able to have differentials for those. There's this entity called sensory neuronopathy uh, that is characterized by um, dysesthesia, asymmetrical sensory loss, ataxia, absent reflexes, and, um, but no motor loss. And uh, the two, the couple commonest conditions that cause it will be perineoplastic, uh, Sjogren's, and drugs. The next group would be the um, isolated uh, nerve palsies of the hand. Um, I will not spend too much time going through the details, but the key is first and foremost to ascertain whether this is truly a single nerve palsy or whether it is part of something bigger, such as a root problem, a plexus problem. And then the next thing to do is to um, elucidate the level of the lesion. And you use inspection, motor exam, sensation, and special tests to do this. So this would apply to ulnar nerve, to radial nerve as well. And finally, we talk about foot drop. So foot drop is sort of the lower limb equivalent of your uh, individual nerve palsies. But usually in the case of a, um, of a uh, 
single limb uh, foot drop, it's, the task is to differentiate whether this is a common peroneal problem, a sciatic problem, or a L4, L4, L5 uh, problem. And uh, once again, you use your motor, reflexes, and sensory examination to distinguish um, these uh, conditions. As I earlier mentioned, I like to screen my patients for the presence of foot drop right before the examination. So when the patient is seated, I tend to ask them to just dorsiflex their, their feet. Uh, because if it is present, then I would be able to ask them to uh, do foot inversion, eversion, hip abduction, and internal uh, rotation to help me distinguish uh, the um, likely level of the lesion. So we've come to the end of uh, this deck of slides. As mentioned, it is not intended to be comprehensive, but um, to provide an overview of some of the common conditions in the respective exams. Uh, for neurology, it's always first and foremost about identifying the, the, the localization, where in the neural axis is the problem, and then subsequently providing etiological differentials to um, what the cause is. Uh, so I hope that you found this helpful and um, all the best.